In the early 1960s, the Passamaquoddy tribe was at an all-time low, but they were about to begin a two-decade battle with the state of Maine, which would forever change themselves, their relationship between the United States government, and all Native American tribes. Its conclusion would bring a new wealth and a new pride to the native peoples of Maine, but with it came unexpected troubles and dissension, which struck to the heart of what it means to be Indian. Preceding these events, in the late 18th century, Congress created the Non-Intercourse Act, declaring that any transfer of land from Indians to non-Indians had to be approved by Congress. Between 1794 and 1833, title to most of the land of the Passamaquoddy was transferred to the state of Maine and individuals. Those transfers, encompassing two-thirds of the state of Maine, were never approved by the U.S. Congress and were therefore illegitimate. This was the foundation for the Maine Indian Land Claims case of 1980. Before the claims settlement, the conditions on the Maine reservations were poor. The houses were small and wooden, with little to no insulation, leaky roofs, and bare floors. In the 60s, 85% of the houses had no toilets or plumbing. The average annual family income is $3,000, well below the national poverty level. Most members of the Passamaquoddy tribe live on this 100-acre reservation on the northeast coast of Maine. Here, an unemployment rate of 50% is a sign that things are getting better. Intolerance for the tribal people and their culture was common in many areas of Maine, and over time, they grew used to the treatment. The discrimination was very regular. As a matter of fact, it happened so regular we didn't even know that it was discrimination. Um, we, one of the things about an oppressed people is they get so used to it, they think it's normal. And you act a certain way accordingly, and you try to survive by saying that's the way it is. So there was all of this going on, and, and the saddest part is that we went along with it because we thought it was normal, and the other thing is it was so hopeless that we thought that we couldn't change it. Indians were derided by whites and treated with the same contemptuous nature that blacks in the South were suffering, although resident whites blinded themselves to this. As Donald Hansen of the Kennebec Journal wrote in 1965, Maine folk can get pretty upset when a Negro in Mississippi has to move to the back of the bus, and yet remain relatively indifferent when they learn that barbers refuse to cut the hair of a Passamaquoddy Indian. In 1964, George Stevens heard the sound of chainsaws near his house, cutting Indian land, and he went to his brother John, the governor of the Passamaquoddy in Indian Township for help. Well, it st all started when uh, when my brother George, you know, uh, stopped me on the way home from work, and uh, he was complaining that uh, Mr. Places was trying to move family out, and George had I don't know 14 or 15 kids, and uh, I wasn't ready to move. We. Uh, Went to, uh, went to the governor first. Even though this infringement of Indian land violated multiple treaties, Governor John Reed of Maine refused to involve himself. The Passamaquoddy had finally been pushed to the limit of their patience and began the litigation process that would eventually evolve into the claims case. The settlement of the Indian lands claims is going to make for some tense times in Maine in the years ahead. But for the Passamaquoddy and the Penobscot, it is the beginning of the American Indian dream to play the game by the white man's laws and win. Before the tribes could do anything about their situation, they needed to find a lawyer to support them, which they soon realized was a difficult task. Said, we don't have a lawyer, we don't need to. We went to see uh, everyone in Cowards, and none of them would take it. I, I think Francis Lola was the one that came up to me and I said, there's a lawyer in, in uh, Eastport that would take this case. And I said, well, who is it? And I said, well, it was Don Jellers. Don Jellers was the first lawyer for the Passamaquoddy and the only attorney willing to take on the land claims case. Although he fought for four years on the Indian side, his drug dealing became a liability, and in March 1968, he fled the country after being entrapped by a police sting set up just days after he filed the first claims case. That was the hardest thing that I had to had to do in my time. I had a fire attorney that wanted to help, but uh, wrong gun help. And when I did, I uh, I searched another two years, and uh, Tom Turin was here at one time, and I met him as a young. Well, he was uh, just an intern, I guess, uh, doing some research for Tom. 
Uh, we didn't meet again till I don't know, we was in Boston, uh, Washington to a conference. I said, oh, by the way, I'm, I'm looking for a lawyer. <laughs> he said, you are? I said, yeah. He just graduated. I'm going to be graduating in the spring, I think it was. He said, I would love to tackle, and I said, well, job is yours if you want it. Tom Train made several modifications to the original case, expanding the claim to two-thirds of Maine. The state of Maine was becoming too hostile towards the tribes, making a victory impossible. In 1972, a new strategy was developed. They would go into a federal court asking a judge to order the federal government to sue the state of Maine on behalf of the tribes. For years, the validity of the claims was debated, but in 1975, Judge Genoux declared that the claim was valid, ordering the Justice Department to bring action against Maine. The state government still refused to take the matter seriously, as the amount of land involved was ridiculous. Slowly, though, Maine was forced to wake up. The scope of the case was so big that we felt that no court in the United States would ever award us anything. Because if, if it did, it would have to say, all right, two-thirds of the state belongs to the native people, everybody else leave. And they, of course, the opposition used that as a strategy. The Indians are going to kick you out of their homes. And they used it very effectively. There's no way that in this country, I don't think uh, Congress or anyone would stand for taking our homes. I mean, this is something that, that uh, all the homeowners, they didn't do it. I think this is something that happened 200 years ago. And I didn't do it. And, you know, you and I as a white middle class American don't, you know, all we do is have to take care of this minority and that minority, and nobody really ever thinks about us. Farmers threatened to shoot any Indians that came near their property, and Indian children were being beaten up in schools in Woodland, Eastport, and Old Town. Congressmen and senators who had originally helped the tribes backed out when they were threatened, until the only white leader supporting the Passamaquoddy was President Carter, and his term was nearly over. The federal and state governments tried to delay the case until Reagan was elected, as he had promised to terminate it, and the tribes were running out of money to send people to the negotiations. It became urgent for them to make sacrifices so they wouldn't lose everything. Although the tribes claimed right to over 12 million acres of the state of Maine, they soon made considerable concessions, accepting a much smaller amount. Not everyone in the tribes were happy with this compromise, though, saying that more was lost than gained. They had ways of trying to get you to say yes to something you didn't understand. And, I mean, people here even myself, I've, I've had three plus years of college, um, and I could not understand that document. In 1980, after a 10-year battle, the tribes forced the United States government to compensate for millions of acres stolen over the past 200 years. Finally accepting $81.5 million and 300,000 acres of designated woodland, as well as opening the door to successful land claims negotiations for many other tribes. Instead of wood shacks and bare floors, the reservation houses are like any other modern house. Warm, clean, with electricity and running water. But for these modern comforts, have the Passamaquoddy given up what it means to be Passamaquoddy? The sudden wealth of the tribe brought back relatives who have given up their heritage for a more profitable life. Many of them grew up in a white world, and their return has created new conflicts within the tribe, diluting tribal customs, redirecting tribal priorities, and changing what it means to be Passamaquoddy. As Hubert Humphrey once said, no real answers have yet been found to this basic question. How can all the Indian people become a part of the total spectrum of American life without each one having to ask himself the question, to be or not to be Indian? I think in order for us to have any um, chance at surviving as Passamaquoddy people, we really need to uh, stop and take a look back at where we come from in order to determine our future. Because we have to remember as Passamaquoddy people, we have certain values that are totally different from the outside. And there are things that we do differently from the outside. But until that's recognized, we're just gonna blend right into the mainstream. And one day they can look back and say, there's no past McCordy's left. And by the rules that we have to live under, they will have done what they set out to do. And we'll be but, Annals in the pages of history, I guess is what you call it.